Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetective. Before we do get started, I want to encourage you to pick up my uh, first Christmas ebook in the superhero comedy series, The Speed of Santa. It's available in the Kindle store. And you can pick up all my ebooks at store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, the original air date, August the 11th, 1950. And the title is The Quiet Magpie. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. Those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end. But they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, The Quiet Magpie. That's a lie! A deliberate, dirty lie! Oh, Counsel, will you restrain the defendant, Mr. Calloway, from making another such outburst? Proceed, Mr. Deacon. Thank you, Your Honor. As I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, in further proof that Vincent Calloway murdered his father, Homer Calloway, in cold blood, the state has established that a violent hatred existed between them, a hatred that crystallized through the years as Vincent Calloway grew from a pampered, coddled, only child into an indolent wastrel of a man, content to lavish on himself the profits from the Calloway Oil Company, his father's business, without once lifting so much as a finger in the firm's behalf. That's not true! I worked in the... Counsel for the defense will advise his client that the court will not countenance another interruption of this sort. Thank you, Your Honor. A hatred, ladies and gentlemen, that reached explosive proportions when Vincent Calloway recently took as his bride an ex-showgirl. A woman with a long and tarnished history of flagrant fortune hunting. A woman whom he flaunted in the face of his father's expressed wishes and deep desires to the contrary. Further, the state has proved that just two days prior to his murder, Homer Calloway had decided definitely to change his will. Why? Why, other than to eliminate his son from its benefits? The court requests that the prosecution confine itself to the facts. Continue, Mr. Deasy. Very well, Your Honor. The facts are eloquent enough. Homer Calloway was murdered before his desired changes in his will could be executed. Next, we learned that on the night of the murder, a desperate effort was made by the killer to cloud the real circumstances of the crime by setting the scene to look as though Homer Calloway had surprised a common thief, robbing his private office. This clumsy attempt was at once proved by police officers to be completely faked. The motive was robbery, all right, but on a grand scale. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us proceed to tighten this web of proof around Mr. Vincent Calloway. Let us show beyond any doubt that it was he... There was no doubt about it. Vincent Calloway was losing the fight for his life. D.T., the crisp, tab-colored assistant D.A., was cutting him to ribbons. When they called Philly Sloman to the stand, I turned around and took a good look. Because it was Felix Lohman who had telephoned me earlier and hired me to come to the trial and be on hand when he testified. He was a tired little man with a jaded cherub face who got up and walked unsteadily down the aisle to the bailiff's table. He acted like a man on the verge of collapse. Are you uh, all right, Mr. Lohman? Yes. Uh, Yes, yes, I believe so. Raise your right hand. 
Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. State your name. Felix Lohmann. Take the stand. Now, uh, Mr. Lohmann, will you please tell this court what your association with the late Homer Calloway was? Why, yes, sir. I was Homer's best friend for many years. I was his personal advisor and confidant until I... Oh. Mr. Lohman, the man's ill. Get a doctor. No, 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 that, that won't be necessary, sir. It's nothing, really. I have a friend here, Mr. Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. He, he'll help me. Is there Mr. Marlowe here? That's the way it played. My client was helped to his feet, and as I half carried him out of the room, I heard the judge adjoining court for the day. All the way down to my car, Felix Lohman stayed as limp as a damp bedsheet. But the minute we drove away, he began a recovery that couldn't be credited to the fresh air alone. When we got a few blocks west on Wucha Boulevard, a smile spread over his Cupid doll face like warm syrup over a waffle. That's a good restaurant. Pull in there, Marlo. All right. Mmm, I, I feel like a piece of pie. Uh, now look, Mr. Lohman, not ten minutes ago you were dropping dead in a courtroom. How you feel like a piece of pie? What is this? Come on, let's go inside where we can talk. All right. My performance at the trial was a fake, a delaying action, Marlo. A bit for time. Oh? And believe me, we need all the time we can get. To do what? To save young Vincent Calloway's life. How about this boot? Oh, yeah, sure. So you think he's innocent, is that it? Why? I have known Vince since he was just a boy. Mm -hmm. He's no killer. Couldn't be. It's, it's completely alien to his nature. Well, from what I heard in that hard-boiled court today, you'll need a little something more tangible than that, Mr. Lohman. I've got something. Care to see the dinner menu, gentlemen? Uh, no. Just a big piece of cherry pie and a glass of milk for me. Yes, just sir. coffee, thanks. Now, well, Mr. Lohman, sell me. According to the D.A., Vincent had plenty of motive. Oh, he hated his father, all right. We all did, one time or another, Marlo. And got hated right back, too. Homer was that kind. I, hard, lonely, lived on work and nothing else. But the rest of that motive stuff... You mean about the will? Exactly. Ah. Vince expected several years ago to be cut out of his father's will. He was resigned to it. So that's out as a motive for Vince. Well, aren't you forgetting that was before Vince married a very expensive little plaything? Yeah. Maybe she changed his economic philosophy. Uh -huh. Now you're getting warm, Marlo. But you're still a little off. How do you mean? The girl's name is Joyce. Yeah. I'm sure she couldn't change Vince that much, not drive him to murder. But I'm also sure that Joyce herself would try anything. Uh, and, and, well, that's where you come in, Marlo. Something fishy, my boy. Extremely fishy. Yeah, well... Oh. Uh, that's fine, thank you. Now, uh, tell me, what's fishy, Felix? Are you trying to say you think Joyce is a killer? I don't know. I, I don't know, but I do know that item one, Vince was worried about her for, for some reason a few days before his father's death. So? So, in this mess broke... I checked up on her myself. Mm -hmm. Followed her home a few times. That's at 2313 North Ogden. Mm -hmm. And item two, I saw a man hanging around the place. A fellow with two gold teeth right in front. And dark, five o'clock shadow, uh, kind of whiskers. I followed him once. Know where Angel's Flight is? Sure. Uh, that's where I lost him. But I learned that his name is Stoner. Stoner, huh? Mm -hmm. What about item three? Blackmail. I don't know how or where, Marlowe, but it's there. Oh. And Vincent's caught in the middle, and good and tight. Yes. Mm. You've got to find out about this fast. I wish I could go along, but Joyce knows me too well, and that stoner has spotted me also, I'm afraid. So I guess it's up to you. Okay, I'll get started. I can reach you where? Home. That stone 3962. 3962. And Marlowe, I'm just an old fuddy duddy But that boy, Vincent, means a lot to me. And time is awfully short. Give us your best, will you?
I left little Felix Lohman ordering a big piece of cherry pie and went outside. It was almost dark. I decided to try Joyce Calloway on the North Ogden Drive sector first. I finally located number 2313, which was neatly hidden in a series of obtuse redwood angles surrounding the rose-tinted glass front door to an extravagant duplex. I was about to push the buzzer when the door closed at the side of the house. So instead, I stepped back into a dense clump of handy landscaping and waited. It was a man. And enough light filtered along the walk from the street lamp to show his heavy dark beard even after a fresh shave. The light also glittered off a pair of gold teeth front and center. But he whistled through as he passed. Whatever had happened inside obviously hadn't worried Mr. Stoner much. But it began to worry me. I decided to take my chances on picking him up later. After he'd gone, I went up to the door again, and the girl who walked through the entrance hall and taught me looked as soft and as glossy as a well-brushed kitten. Maybe it was her yellow shoulder-length hair or the flowing folds of the black velvet hostess gown. In either case, it was even better with the rose-colored glass door out of the way and the unmistakable scent of taboo in its place. Yes? What do you want? You're Joyce Calloway? That's right. I'm Marlowe, Mrs. Calloway, Phil Marlowe. I'd like to come in and talk to you a minute about your husband. Vince? Hmm. What about him? Well, it'll keep long enough for us to go inside, huh? Well, well, all right. Come on in. Uh. This is my apartment. Now, what is it? Well, first, I'd like to congratulate you. The moral support you didn't give him today was real great. <laughs> Too busy shopping to drop in at your husband's murder trial? Why, you... Oh. <laughs> okay, baby, I asked for it. I didn't go because Vince said that he didn't want me to. Now get out. And the next time your lousy district attorney's office wants to find out something, you can Just tell him... Just a minute. But... I'm not from the DA. I'm strictly freelance. At the moment, I'm interested in a small matter of blackmail and how a man named Stoner ties in. I don't know what you're talking about. You'd better get out of here. Now, listen, baby. I'm tired and it's late. I want to know about Stoner. I don't know any Stoner. Okay, let's make it easy. He's a bird with a heavy beard and two gold choppers, and I just saw him leave by your side door about five minutes ago. Does that help? You're crazy. There's been nobody else in here tonight. Now, 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 get out of here. Sure. Sure. No, Joyce, you're either awfully dumb or awfully scared. I don't know which. But neither one is going to pay off for you. I promise. <laughs> Starting at Angel's Flight and working west, it took three solid hours of scraping through the scum on Bunker Hill before I got a lead on a guy named Stoner. And another hour went by before I actually found the swayback three-story rooming house he called home. The scaly front porch was a clutter of big, rusty bird cages, and the mangy inmates of which complained as I eased the rickety front door open and pushed my way into a moldy smell thick enough to chew. A ragged row of tin mailboxes said Stoner's room was second floor rear. So I started up. I got as far as the landing when I heard a voice in the hall above. I went on slowly until I could see. It was Stoner. He was back to me talking on the whole phone. I got my thirty-eight in hand and listened. Yeah, well, uh, well, uh, listen, Joyce, don't worry, I'll take care of him. Yeah, I'll be watching for him. Yeah, I'll meet you just like I said, only remember, it's not good for us to be seen together now. So be careful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Goodbye, Joyce. You didn't start watching fast enough, Stoner. Who are you? I'm Marlow. The guy, little cutie pie, just tipped you off about. Don't move those hands, Donna. I'd just love to collect that mouthful of old gold you're wearing. You're no cop. What are you going to do with me? What's your ankle? I'm going to spill the truth out of you, Goldie. To keep an innocent guy from taking a rap for a murder you and his own charming wife cooked up. What makes you think I'm connected with that? Maybe I've got eyes in the back of my head. That so? You ain't got eyes in the back of your head. Because if you did, you'd duck. Oh! See what I mean, Marlo? <laughs> Thanks, pal. Let's get out. Of 
In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, although the intention of the entire world is now focused on the critical situation in the Far East, there are still tragic remnants of another war in Europe. There are still hungry people, children who need clothes. There is still sickness and the ever-present misery and poverty. Now as before, it is your job to help these people. Help them through your generosity, through care. One $10 care package can feed and clothe an entire family in France, in Italy, in Germany. Send hope to these destitute peoples of Europe by showing you care through care. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe and Tori, the quiet magpie. The feeling of being hit from behind becomes more or less routine. <laughs> There's an explosion against the back of your head. Your backbone is suddenly electrified and your legs melt. And a chunk of the floor rushes at you from a cockeyed angle. Where it connects, there's a second explosion and you start down that long black corridor. Very sick to your stomach. Yeah, it's routine, all right. But that doesn't make it any easier every time it happens. I rolled over onto my back in that musty hallway at Stoner's rooming house and forced my eyes open. As I did, I felt a stinging pain like a pinprick in the center of my spine. Then as things started back into focus, I saw a beer bottle gripped in a fat, freckled hand that belonged to a fat, freckled face that peered into mine. It started a conversation just before I could get the pinprick in my back. Well, 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 look what the cat has dragged in. And who are you, chum? A jewel tea man. You need... Oh, oh, my back. What's the matter, chum? <sighs> a little gold ornament. Oh, you must have rolled onto it, chum. Yeah. And whoever slugged me must have dropped it. <clears throat> what is it? It looks like a bird or something. Yeah. A magpie in flight. Looks like it broke off or something. Probably a pin from some babe's handbag or bracelet or... Or it's a... yours, maybe, huh? Well, if it was alive, it might be. Birds are my speciality, or ain't you noticed? Oh, you the landlord here? Yes, that's right. So now I'm back to you. Who are you, chum? And how come you're folded up in my hallway? Well, it's a long story, and I won't keep you from your birds with it. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Now, don't let the Audubon pitch throw you, chum. I've got a couple of hobbies. Like sticking your nose in other people's business? Like bending noses that get stuck into my business. So clear out, chum, and stay out or you'll see what I mean. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Whatever you say, bird lover. After all, this is your nest. So long. I figured it would play smoother if I left my tail between my legs and waited for him to return to his birds and beer. So outside, I let ten precious minutes go by before I made my move. Then it was around to the back up a lopsided rusted fire escape and in through an open window to Stoner's room. There I hoped something would tell me where he was going to meet Joyce Calloway. But after wasting another ten minutes, it turned up nothing more than the two words Gate L scribbled on the back of an old envelope, which could have meant airport, train station, or bus depot if they meant anything. I went for the hall phone I'd overheard Stoner use and put through a call to my client Felix Lohman to bring him up to date. Arlo, this is splendid. Why, from what you see, Vincent Calloway is practically a free man. Now, now, so I understand. Stoner and Joyce Calloway, who are going to blackmail Vincent, kill Vincent's father so that Vincent would inherit a fortune and thus be a more profitable target for blackmail. Is that it? Yeah, more or less, with, of course, everything backfiring when Vincent was arrested for the murder. But look, Mr. Lohman, we'll add and subtract later, huh? Right now, we got to catch up to him. Yes, but where? You, you said Stoner got away. Yeah, that he was heading for a meeting with Joyce Calloway. See, I got one thing to go on. I found the words Gate L scribbled on an envelope. Do you have any idea if it would mean a train G depot or a bus? Gate L? Yeah. Marlo, is that what you said, Gate L? Yeah, yeah. Does it mean anything to you? Of course. Gate L, Marlo. It's at the oil refinery, the side entrance on Lafayette Street. Holy smoke. Say, Loman, what's the address of that place? It's uh, East L.A., isn't it? Yes, 1100 South Cooper between Kendall and Lafayette Streets. Covers a square block. Uh -huh. Now, look, Loman, do you have a gun there in your place, I mean? A gun? Yeah. My well, good. Get it and go over to the refinery right away. I may need someone who knows the inside, the names and numbers of all doors, windows, and pipes. You got that? Yes, but why not the police? 
Because they come with bells on. We can't take a chance. All right, just as you say. I'll be waiting for you. Good. I'm closer than you are there at Angel Flight. Goodbye, Marlo, and a million thanks for what you've done already. Why, without you... Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about it later, Mr. Loman. Goodbye. And to me, hello. Oh, fine. Now, don't move an inch, chum. You'll get this beer served, bottle and all. Now, Nosey, what made you come back? Buried treasure. You see, it's up here, I know. One of your little birds now, told me. Now, shut up. Remember, smart bloke, you're an housebreaker. And anything I do to you is okay with the law. Now, what's with you and Stoner? Why, do you keep a diary? No, a neat bank balance. And all of it comes from cutting in on the right thing at the right time. So once more, chum, what's with you and Stoner? Well, you see, we went to the same prep school, and I promised the headmaster I'd always keep an eye on... Okay, Snoopy, you asked for it! The light got... I figured right, bird boy. Bum aim goes with a bum temper. It's only just beginning, sweetheart. It's black in here like a pit. When I get my hands on you, you're going to be sorry. You hear that? Well, talk up. Talk up. Come on, yellow belly. Let's hear from you. Come on. Okay. So it's hide and seek, huh? No. Tag the game, bird boy, and you're in. Now listen to the birdies sing, chum. A 20-minute drive from Angel's flight to the Callaway oil refinery in East L.A. and all the way through the wide, deserted streets that the city's heavy industries called home. After three tries, I found the sliding gate marked L. On one side of it, and folded up like a marionette on his day off, was the night watchman, unconscious, blood oozing from a small cut on the side of his head. And inside, thousands of square feet of pavement dotted with a dozen different kinds of massive black metal oil tanks that were ringed with fat pipes and skinny ladders. And in the pale glow of a half moon looked like the kind of distorted stuff bad dreams are made of. I slipped my thirty-eight out of its shoulder holster, moved into the narrow shadow of a long, low building, and slid a careful step at a time toward a center structure. It was shaped like a giant fishbowl on stilts. And then I heard it. It had come from someplace just under the fishbowl. As I ran toward it, I was ready for what would be left of Felix Lohman. And I started to curse myself for ever letting him come on ahead on his own. But when I was close enough to where I could see, I quit calling myself names. Felix Lohman was there all right, but very much alive. Alive and holding on tight to a smoking revolver that was still pointing down at the crumpled form of Stoner at his feet. Stoner, who was very dead. Marlo, Marlo, she's up there. She has a gun, Marlo. Look, up on that platform behind those pipes. Hold it, Lohman, get down. But Marlo, you must... Get down, she's got cover up there, we haven't. I don't care. You rotten, scheming woman, you are going to pay for all this... You're going to die even as you killed Vincent's no, father. No, Felix, I didn't. I didn't. Yes, me. yes, Mrs. Calloway. There's no other way out for you. It's too late for you and your lies. I'm not it's you. your end, Joyce Calloway. And then you deserve. Oh, you fool, she'll get you, Loman. You louse. My shoulder. It'll be your life, Loman, if you don't drop that gun. Well, dear client, what's your answer? Do you drop it or do I shoot again? No, no. I'll drop it. I, uh, what's she say? Okay, Joyce, come on down. Get a good look at your husband's benefactor. Who incidentally murdered Homer Calloway, murdered his accomplice Sona here, and tried to murder you. My shoe. Now, for a smart guy, you're pretty stupid, Loman. You should take better care of your cufflinks. A gold magpie shines in the moonlight, especially when you extend your arm to shoot people. Mahalo. Here. Here, yeah, Loman's the mate, the one that broke off in the hallway at Sona's place. That much of you can still be patched up. All right, Mr. Milo. Now that Vincent's lawyer has heard it and the police have written it down, the press have printed it, how about me? I don't follow it. For instance? Well... Felix Lohman killed Homer because Homer no longer had any use for him. But with Homer out of the way... And I... Vincent in this place, Felix would be set. Your husband, he could fool. Oh, yes, but the way the whole thing boomed... Oh, that was just I... bad luck. You see, 
He staged a robbery at Homer's office just to throw the law off. Oh. Well, it didn't. But more than that, it almost nailed Vincent. Still with me? Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, the second house over there. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. oh, what was the blackmail? How come? Well, that was Felix again. And out of whole cloth. You see, if Vincent lost his trial, Felix lost everything he killed for it. So using Stoner, he had me playing follow the leader. Like Stoner pretending to have just left my place when you arrived. That's right. Oh. That and Stoner setting everything up nice and neat. You see, he was on the phone all right, but when he knew that I was there, he pulled the switch. And very carefully planted the name Joyce. He did? Uh-huh. And last of all, Stoner being killed by Felix and no longer had any use for him and had a lot of reasons to fear him in what was supposed to be self-defense. Get it? Get it. Uh -huh. He gives you a little to go on and then a lot more each time you get there. Yeah. At the right moment, he brings you in with a phone call that tells you to come at once to the refinery. Oh. If you want to help Vincent. Ooh. How close I came. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Correction. Thank Mr. Magpie. He told me that Felix was the one who dropped me in the hallway at Stoner's, remember? Oh, yes. That made adding the rest easy. Yes, but how fast you add when it counts. Well, good night, Mr. Marlowe. Thanks again. By the time I pulled up in front of my apartment on Franklin, the black in the sky had started to melt into a slate gray. And my eyes ached for the long sleep that... <sighs> they had come. Well... I sat there for a minute. I lit a cigarette and I thought about birds. Did you, did you ever stop to think how some people remind you of birds? For instance, the landlord. <laughs> if ever I saw a vulture in pants, he was it. And, and my client, Loman. A hawk with horn rims. And joy. A powder pigeon. And then there's Marlow. I wonder what kind of a bird I am. Hmm. A dead pigeon. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the transcribed cast were Harold Dierenforth, Lynn Allen, Wilms Herbert, Charles Lung, Bill Johnstone, and Ralph Moody. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time, an eager young kid took a beating in an alley. A lobster face began to boil and a pair of month-old corpses got together. All because a woman in a dark tunnel kept a secret that didn't belong to her. Most of us approve of saving for a rainy day, but these days it's hard to have enough left over to save. It's easy to put off the saving until tomorrow, and that tomorrow never seems to come. The best way to make yourself save a little every payday is to join the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond a month plan where you bank. Money invested in United States savings bonds today will make possible many dreams for tomorrow. So arrange to save with United States savings bonds. Remember, automatic saving is sure saving. Every Friday night, CBS brings you stories taken from the files of parole boards of the 48 states with only the names changed. These stories give in detail the events of a criminal's life up to the time he is up for parole. Then, before you hear the board's decision, you can make up your mind. Is this man ready to be set free? It's been hailed by press and public alike as an outstanding anti-crime show, and you can hear it now by staying tuned, because Up for Parole follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking.
This is CBS, where you find songs for sale every Friday night at the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. There was something a little off to me uh, when I uh, heard Gerald Moore's reading of the opening. It just didn't have the same zing as usual. I did like the courtroom opening for the story. Uh, really, it was w- one of those things that they did on uh, Philip Marlowe that helped to keep the story fresh and from seem- seeming too uh, rote. Well, we have listener comments and feedback regarding Doc Easter. And a uh, comment from Larry, um, who writes, uh, he mentions a couple of dates in the 40s in the show. Why would he uh, do this if this was in the 1930s, unless it was supposed to be science fiction? Enough said. Case closed. And uh, good catch. Also caught by uh, Doc, who says, um, As for the date of the Doc Easter episode, unless it was science fiction, I don't believe the script would have included the reference to dates in 1941 and 47 if it was recorded in 39. I have no doubt it was not a 1939 audition show. Frankly, I didn't believe the quality was very good, so I'm not surprised it never made it to a long-term series. Um, Well, thanks so much. Um, And I think the reason I didn't catch the 1940s date was that the quality of the recording and the dialogue was uh, kind of... um, Hard to hear uh, perfectly for me. So I missed those dates in there, which I thought that it was 1940s anyway. But there are these things. um, Dennis at the Digital Deli uh, calls them uh, OTRisms, where there's an error. It gets into circulation and with all of the exemplars, and it becomes mighty hard to correct. But yeah, I would definitely lean towards the 1940s based on the information uh, provided. Uh, and I do think that there are some shows where I could listen to them all day. And then there are some shows where one episode really goes a long way. I find the one episode of Doc Easter uh, a very fun curiosity. If there were 220 episodes in circulation, um, yeah, that would be too much. Um, but one episode I'm kind of like, this is kind of interesting as a one-off episode. But thanks so much for the comments. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with, uh, Nick Carter. And then join us next Wednesday for another episode of Philip Marlowe. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.